Preventive maintenance is critical to the success of your overall equipment management strategy. It's about maintaining equipment at top operating condition, reducing risk of failure and the related unscheduled repairs, and optimizing equipment owning and operating costs. Now, to talk preventive maintenance and what it means to you, we have Nick Rummel and Jeff Payne from Caterpillar. And together, these guys have more than five decades of preventive maintenance experience, and they're here to answer any questions you may have. Let's see what they're up to today. Um, I, they're over this way. Follow me. Hey, Nick. Jack. We're over here, Tom. All right. How are you guys going? What's up? Great. Today? Well, today we're going to start off talking about some oil sampling, but at the same time, we're going to talk about safety. As Jeff starts climbing up the machine, you're going to notice that he's going to use three points of contact. You always want to make sure you use three points of contact when climbing on and climbing off of machines, mainly just to help keep you, give you some more stability. One of the other things Jeff's doing that we don't really notice is he's checking his surroundings. Now he did notice something up there. We've got a cable strung across. Today, he's going to have to duck his head under that. Now if he didn't see that, it's pretty good likelihood that he may have gotten a mark. He possibly could have fallen off from this machine and really gotten hurt. So safety is always paramount. While we're talking about safety, we should also think about these lockout tagout. Now, the, the reason why we want to lock something out is this is a big machine. Jeff could be working on the engine or back here in this compartment where we're going to show you. Someone else may be able to hop into the cab and actually start the machine. Someone may be, get injured or could injure the machine. So we always want to make sure we lock out that machine and make sure that no one can start it. And another thing about safety is seat belts. We don't think about it very often. We think we're pretty safe inside our cabs and they are rated for both fall, over, fall on and rollover protection. But you know, your seat belt is an integral part of the whole safety package that Caterpillar has. Something on seat belts is we recommend that you change those seat belts every three years. It's not a requirement, but it certainly is a recommendation. So Jeff, let's hear about oil samples. All right. Well, Nick, let's talk about uh, oil here. Uh, I'll watch your head here when I bring this over so we don't have an accident. So let's talk about oil a little bit. We keep talking about the cleanliness of oil, why it's so important in today's machines. You know, we've uh, tightened our tolerances up on these machines to give you machines that perform better. They're more product, have more productivity out of them and uh, burn less fuel. To do that, we've tightened the tolerances up, really tightened these machines. CAT system uh, tolerances are between two and 30 microns. Nick tells me that uh, the human eye can only see 40 microns. And when you get uh, gray hair like this, I think I'm up around uh, 100 microns. Yep, 80 and, to 100. Yep, and a, a human hair is about 80. Yep. So. This is why we need to be so important when we're working in these compartments doing services, when we're opening things up that we don't get contaminants in there. And uh, let's talk about oil on this machine and uh, the hydraulic oil and how that oil runs through the machine and when it gets filtered. So we have a tank up here with oil in it. And uh, when the machine uh, is running and it calls for demand, that oil comes down through a big pipe down here, comes up through our pump from our pump, it goes out to our controls, our joysticks, um, through our control valve, goes out, does some work for us on a cylinder, gets returned back. Did you hear me say return? When it gets to the return, it comes through a filter in here, the return oil filter. So that oil is not getting filtered till it's all done. So whenever we open up this tank and put oil in, we need to be very conscientious that if we introduce any dirt into the tank, it will not be filtered so that oil has traveled through the whole system on this machine. So on these machines, a lot of them, we can take oil samples. I just want to stress how important it is to take a good sample so you can get a good reading back from the SOS lab and have good results and know what's happening inside your machine. There's a lot of ways that the technician can contaminate those samples if he doesn't do a good job. This is probably a great time to talk about the dealer expertise that we have at the dealers. 
Exactly. You know, Jeff, our dealers are well equipped to handle any situation, especially when it comes to contamination control and actually knowing what your machine has on it and the things that he should do to ensure that that machine will always run properly. Contamination control, as Jeff said, is becoming bigger and bigger. We need to make sure that our oil and all of our fluids are very, very clean. Part of that is through our oil sampling system. Now, if we take an oil sample, the sample is only as good as the way we take it. So Jeff's gonna run through and explain to us how to properly take that sample and do it cleanly. So to take a proper oil sample, contrary to you know, uh, what you might think, you can't pull it out of a drain stream, can you, Nick? No, never in a running stream. Yep, so to do this, we're gonna take the cap off. We have uh, different color-coded caps with little symbols on them. So we know like this is hydraulic oil, this is engine oil, it's yellow. Uh, if this machine had a transmission on it, it would have a, uh, a purple one. And then we could find a green cap up on top for the uh, coolant on this machine. So to take a proper sample, we're gonna pull that cap off. It's got a little pin hole in the middle. We'll take a clean, lint-free rag. We're gonna wipe that off. Jeff, let's show them the test port while we're there, just so there's no confusion. Yeah, that's a good idea. Right here next to it, we have another port. It looks very similar on here, but you notice it does not have that little hole in the middle of it. So this is a test port. This is for running diagnostic tests on this machine. We don't know exactly what kind of pressure is behind here without looking in the books. We know there's very low pressure behind here on the sample port. This one here could be as high as, uh, you know, over 5,000 PSI in this machine. On this machine. And so uh, we never want to try to take a sample out of a port like this. So once we wipe this off, we need a clean-out bottle. A clean-out sample is cleaning out the inside of this probe. Now he's pulling that oil sample out of a bag that's already open. We would never recommend doing that, only for your clean out sample. Now the reason why that bag's open is we hate to keep opening up all these new bags during our shows and we're only showing you this as an example, but your oil samples should always be kept in a clean bag, sealed, free from any contaminants. Yep. So if we were going to take a live sample here, we would start the machine up and uh, what do you think? Should I warm the machine up first, Nick? Always, always yeah. warm the machine up. Always want to have a warm machine or warm uh, uh, whatever compartment we're taking that sample from, whether it's engine, hydraulics, transmissions, uh, final drive, axle, uh, swing drive. There's all kinds of samples we can take. But when we take those samples, it's better to have it warmed up a little bit so everything in there is stirred up and we're getting a really good sample. So I've wiped this off. I have a clean out bottle here. I'm going to stick it on here, push in and I'm gonna pull a little bit of oil out. I don't need to fill the bottle up because this is just a clean out sample. I can use this same bottle and move between all my compartments except for my coolant. So uh, I would start out usually with hydraulic. It's usually the cleanest fluid I see. I would move to transmission and then I usually fin finish up with uh, the engine because uh, we all know that diesel uh, engine oil gets kind of dark when it gets old. Once I've done a clean out sample, then I would move to my good sample. I would get a new bag unopened I don't want to open this bag up until I'm ready to take that sample. For the purpose of this uh, seminar here, I'm not going to open up this bag. But I would open this up, build me up another container like this. Now, Nick, do you notice I kept the cap in here? Yes, I did. You I know, kept he, he kept the cap in there to keep it free from contaminants as well. If he was just to set that cap down up here on the, on the riser, or in that compartment, or even stick it in his pocket, he's gonna pick up a lot of contaminants that we don't need in our oil sample. Again, we need to keep this oil at about 1613 or a little bit cleaner on the ISO standards. So always keep that cap in that plastic bag protected until you're ready to screw it on that oil sample. So, hey Nick, you got a, you got a spin on filter down there? Yes, I do. So, uh, Kent makes a lot of different filters. This is a spin on type. And this machine here has both spin-on and cartridge type filters. One of the biggest things I see uh, technicians do out in the field when they uh, think they're saving time on these excavators is they'll take that, uh, that cartridge type filter, there's a cap up here with four bolts, they'll pop them four bolts out and there's a snap ring inside there and they think they're saving time by popping that snap ring out, lifting that lid off, pulling that cartridge out, slapping in a new filter, putting it back together. 
But when they do that, when they break that filter loose in there, they're opening up the clean side and the dirty side of the oil. So we gotta remember, clean side of the fluid is always the big hole. The dirty oil comes in on the small holes on here. So the ideal way, called out in the OMM, the proper way to do one of these cartridge filters on this machine is we take the cap off. There's actually instructions right underneath there. And it tells us how to uh, break a little vent loose. We pick up the handle. We raise it up about a three eighths of an inch. We give it a turn, 180 degrees. And then we pull that whole cartridge out of there. And then we can set that down and take it over to our truck and uh, clean it out, put a new filter in, bring it back in. And you know, Jeff, not only the cartridge filters on the excavators, but also any cartridge filter. Our fuel systems are possibly going to be going to a cartridge filter, depending on uh, which model it is. And a lot of our transmissions use a cartridge type filter. A lot of them have a canister that just screws right on. You always want to drain that filter first, remove the old filter, and then empty the contents and clean that container out or the canister very, very well before you reinstall it and never fill it back up with oil. Always let the filter and the machine fill it with oil and filter it for you. So uh, another thing that I'll see guys do, and uh, I know I've done it the wrong way when I was younger, because I wasn't taught right, was uh, putting on new fuel filters. You ever do it the wrong way, Nick? Yes, unfortunately. Yeah, we both made mistakes, but now we know better, and we know what kind of damage it can do to the fuel systems. These new fuel systems, like we were talking about, are extremely tight tolerances in them. A little over four microns of tolerance in the injectors. And uh, I know they're not cheap to replace them, getting, getting expensive. But what a lot of guys will do, thinking they're saving time, is they'll fill these fuel filters up with fuel. And they always want to pour it, like I said, in that center hole, it's the big hole, right? That's how Easy you did one to it, do I'm it. Sure to, that's how I did it. Yep. What they're doing is they're dumping fuel in here. It's dirty. They're dumping it on the clean side of the filter. And when they run this thing, it's going to suck that dirt right back up into the fuel systems. It's going to contaminate them. It's going to start wearing them out. They're not going to live their full life expectancy like they should. So we can never pre-fill filters on machines. Even the engine oil filter, we don't want to pre-fill. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is, as Jeff mentioned, 40 microns is as small as we can see. Imagine if we fill up an, an engine oil filter because we feel like it's starving the engine when it starts, but we fill that oil up with our bulk fluid. If our bulk fluid isn't clean when we, when we put it into that filter, we are now contaminating the engine. Parts as small as 30 microns can do irreversible damage to your crankshaft main bearings and cam bearings, let alone some of the fuel system operation that we do run from engine oil today. So always remember, never fill the filters. Let the engine or the machine take care of filling those filters for you. And on a lot of our machines, especially the tier four, they're gonna, be, have, they're gonna have electric pumps installed on them. Now these electric pumps are gonna fill the filters for you as soon as you turn on the key or you press a switch inside the cab or in the engine compartment. Yeah, this machine here right, right here has an electric one on. We just key on, we let it sit there for about 30 seconds and it'll pre-fill our filters for us. Here's a tip for you. How do you know when you got a filler like this if it's filled up? And it's filled up? Yeah, you, you know, you don't really know if it's filled up or not. A tip for you is you can take these fillers and tap them, and they're very tinny sounding. And as you prime one with a hand pump or an electric pump, as it becomes dead, dead to, to, the, to the tap, it won't have that ring to it, you can tell that the filter is actually filling up. So you know when you primed it up enough and the filter's full. You know, Jeff, while you're talking about filters, why don't you tell them about the hash marks on the side? Hey, that's a neat feature, isn't it? Every one of our cat spin on filters that I've ever seen has a uh, tightening procedure on it. It tells us about lubing the seal. It tells us to bring it up hand tight. And this particular filter tells us that we need three quarters of a turn. You'll notice that around the can, it has four different lines, 90 degrees apart. This one uh, missing because of the hole cut in for demonstration. But so we know if we bring it up and we're on a, a line here, we can count three lines around as we're I should go the right way, huh, Nick? I'm upside yeah, down. Yeah, lefty loosey, righty tidy. Yeah, that's right. But I know that if I bring it over three lines, I went three quarters of a turn. All of our filters are like that. Now, are all our filters have the same tightening torque? No, absolutely not. A lot of our filters may only require a half a turn or a third of a turn. Some are a sixth of a turn. They may be a turn and a third. 
All the filters are marked appropriately. Not all of them are gonna have four marks on them. Some may have six. It just varies with what filter it is and what the tightening sequence is for that filter. I've seen as many as 10 on some of them, and some are as little as one-tenth of a turn yep. on some of these little filters. But this gives you the, the proper tightening way of these filters, and if you look at our fuel filters anymore, you're gonna see on there that they tell you not to pre-fill them. You know, another neat thing we're doing with uh, fuel filters today, um, if you get a new fuel filter for some of our machines, you're going to notice in the package, when you uh, take this out of the package, and it always should be in a package, right, Nick? Yes, always so that, in the package till you're ready to use it. That's right, so we know that it's clean when we put it on. In that package, you're going to find a rubber seal. You might wonder what that seal's for. Well, I'm going to tell you. The threads where this goes on, you take that little rubber seal, and it goes up on the threads before you screw this on. If it has one on there, you need to take the old one off, of course. But by taking that seal off, putting the new one on, sealing this up, what we're actually doing, Nick, is we're sealing this part of the filter from this part of the filter. And remember, as I told you a few minutes ago, this is the clean side, this is the dirty side. So the filters never did leak before, but now we're actually creating this seal in between here, and that's all because we're so worried about contamination getting in these fuel systems. Again, if you think about how big 40 microns is, something that you can see, or 80 microns, which was what our hair is, it can leak around those threads. Even though that filter is tight, you can still get some leakage through those threads. Now, while we were talking about some of the fluids and oil sampling, I'd like to show you an oil sample report. Now, this oil sample report has a lot of information on it. This first page is green. That means that all systems are normal, everything is functioning normally, and all of our wear materials are in the right place. This next page, we have some monitor. The yellow is just like a stoplight, red, yellow, green. Monitor means that we should maybe take some action or possibly just resample that compartment after this machine has run for a while and the filters have been able to do its job. But it still gives us all the wear materials and the recommendations. Then finally, we have the red. Now the red means there's action required. It may be something like uh, drop the fluid out of that particular component, or it could even mean that we need to kidney loop that system on the machine. Now kidney looping is a filtering process where we pull the oil out of that component, run it through a bank of filters, and then put it back in. Now the nice thing about our oil, oil samples and our oil service is that it is available online. Now it's available not only through Vision Link and, part, and uh, Parts Store, but also it's available through the oil manager software system. Now our oil lab, <clears throat> excuse me, our oil lab processes over six million samples a year from three, three global locations, along with some of our cat dealers having the same equipment that we do. We run state-of-the-art equipment. We are the only OEM that does our own oil sampling. We have established wear tables. We understand how much material can be bad for your component or your machine. An example of that is, imagine you have $10,000 in pennies and you put them in the back of a pickup truck. You take five dimes and throw them in with those $10,000 worth of pennies. That's five parts per million. If we see five parts per million of chrome in an engine oil sample, that means a problem. we have a problem. Probably the piston rings, that's where the chrome would be located on, in an engine. But if it was in a transmission, we would be looking at bearings. And hydraulic systems, we'd be looking at cylinder rods. So always remember, we've got to keep things clean, and that's where our oil samples come in. So take a good sample, keep the fluid clean, and then your components will live a long, long time. So, you know, while we're talking about this, uh, you know, our dealers have a lot of dealer expertise when it comes to maintenance, repairing of your vehicles, and uh, they also offer a thing called a uh, CSA, or Customer Service Agreement, where you can, uh, when you purchase a machine, you can uh, pick up where they're taking care of service for a certain amount of time. And Nick, what do you all know about CSAs? Well, CSAs, our customer service agreement, we can not only schedule, like buying a new car, some of the, some of the new cars you see on TV come with planned maintenance as part of the package. What you can do with a CSA is you actually buy a planned maintenance package. It could be as simple as the services that are required, all the way up through planned component replacements, where your cat dealer can help you with all steps through the CSA. 
So what you're telling me, Nick, is that uh, I could buy a new machine, buy a CSA, and uh, not have any worries about taking care of that machine for a certain amount of time, right? That's true, yes, the customer would have no worries. That's one of the other features uh, while we're talking about CSA is a Vision Link. Vision Link is a new electronic software that's, that's available on all CAP machines today. Vision Link enables the customer to go to their PC, whether it's at their das desk or even on the road, they're going to be able to pull up that machine. Not only will they be able to tell what the location is, they're going to know how many hours that machine has run today, how much fuel it's used, if there's any fault codes present, and if there's any services due. That information all get, also gets fed to their local Caterpillar dealer. So in the case of a CSA, your cat dealer will contact you before you even realize that your machine is ready for a service. So another thing we'd like to talk about too a little bit here, while we're talking about dealers and stuff like that, are inspections. You know, these machines uh, operate in some pretty harsh environments and uh, we need to do daily inspections on them. Those daily inspections can be found for a lot of machines out on our uh, safety.cat.com yes We've got all kinds of checklists out there there's also some more detailed sheets that your dealers have that uh, we can do uh, what we call a TA1 or a technical analysis that's Inspection. actually a TA2 I got a TA2 you handed me the wrong one I Dave. handed you the wrong one the TA1 is is basically just a walk around inspection we're gonna walk around that machine go front to rear we're gonna do everything at, at a particular level. So if we're on the ground, we're gonna do everything that's available for us to check on the ground level. Then we're gonna move up to the midsection level, finally the upper level, and then the cab. You know, uh, I like the way they're laid out because uh, you know, I'm getting slower as I get older and I don't like climbing up and down more than I have to. So the way these inspections are laid out, we do, the, like Nick said, the ground level, we do a mid-level, we do an upper level, and then we do implements and attachments, and it saves me from uh, a lot of repeated steps. I do it one level at a time. We're looking for all kinds of things when we're out doing these TA1s. We're looking for hose rubs, we're looking for leaks, we're looking for wires that might be frayed, rubbed, uh, missing uh, zip ties, broken P-clips, all and kinds even, of things. And even things like tire wear and ground engagement tool, tool wear. That's right. And you know, a lot of little things too that you may not think about, but we're checking lights, we're checking wipers, we're checking seat belts, we're checking all these things that, uh, you know, pretty important to that guy who's out there working on second or third shift and needs them lights, making sure the safety uh, uh, backup alarms work on them. And the TA1 is something that we should do about every 500 hours during your 500 hour service. Now the, the second version of that inspection is called a TA2 or technical analysis two. The TA2 goes into a lot of depth. This is typically done every 2,000 hours or annually. What we're gonna do is, is on top of all the inspection that we did with the TA1 and the walk around, we're also going to go through and check all your pressures, all the performance features of that machine, and then adjust them right back up to where they were when they were new. Imagine an excavator like this one slowing down one second or a half second every time it does a cycle. It doesn't seem like much, and the operator isn't gonna notice it. At the end of the year, though, if you had two of these excavators, you would notice that one machine is considerably faster than the other, gets more work done every day than the other one. Peak production is what we're talking about, and also getting rid of that unscheduled downtime. Nobody likes their machine going down. Wouldn't it be nice to know when that machine is gonna go down and for how long? It's another area where your cat dealer can really help you out. Yeah, and downtime, really, unscheduled downtime is very costly. All you owners and operators know that, that it's uh, much simpler, much cheaper to be able to schedule your maintenance, bring it into the shop under your terms, and get them repaired. So that's where these inspections really come in nice. It's uh, very costly to go down in the middle of the job when you're out on a project and have that unscheduled downtime. In fact, I think I had a TA2 done on me the other day, Nick. I went in and got a physical, and they said I'm good, <laughs> for, good for a year now, so. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I don't like the depth some of these TA2s the doctors are doing today. <laughs> What's that with them uh, rubber glove things? Right? Yeah, okay. We're not going to go there. <clears throat> We're also going to talk a little bit about contamination control. Now, we keep talking about how clean our oil needs to be and how, clean, how to properly do a clean oil sample. We can't get clean oil unless we start with clean oil. Now, what I have here is, is an oil safe container. 
Uh, these are available through Parts Store, which is uh, another feature that we have on our web for customers. Now what, what makes these special is, is that this container and this lid are not necessarily a, a pair. We have many different containers of various sizes that are available, and we have quite a few different lids. They all fit the same, they all have the same thread pattern. What makes these oil safe containers unique is one, we're using uh, a smooth plastic for our flexible spout. Now, if we were to use a corrugated plastic, for example, or the old metal galvanized corrugated, we would trap a lot of our larger pieces, 40 microns and above, in those corrugations. That's where the bigger pieces like to hang around, is anywhere where it can settle out. So a smooth, a nice smooth funnel and a nice smooth transition doesn't allow those larger pieces to stay. One of the other things you'll notice is it does have a stop, a physical stop down here on the, on the flexible spout. What that allows us to do is not leave any excessive oil up in this spout in case we happen to leave the cap off. Now this cap should always be in place and I realize it's one of the easiest things there is to lose, but we always need to have that cap in place because there is no replacement for that clean oil. The oil has to be clean at all times. Now, we have a lot of opportunities for contamination control, and your cat dealer has been well-trained by Caterpillar Corporate to help you with those ideas. Jeff? That's right, Nick. So, you know, we've, uh, we've been talking here for a few minutes. Does anybody have any questions out in the audience? We're, we're open for questions on anything we've talked about. If you can... Ah. Uh, Repeat it. The cat filter. What's better about a cat filter? Because I know they're not the cheapest thing out there in the market. On the cat filters, they have some stuff on them, what we call spiral roving and acrylic beading down here. They also have this center core that's made out of uh, nylon. It's 30% uh, stronger and uh, doesn't allow you to have uh, internal contamination within the filter. We also have molded end caps on these filters. These are molded on. Let me uh, show you a couple things on uh, this filter here. You notice there's no spiral roving compared to this one. No acrylic beading. The end caps are glued on to the filter media. A lot more chance of leakage there. They have this metal core inside. This metal core is stamped out, so that's where we can get some internal uh, contamination within the filter itself. Not only internal contamination, Jeff, but also on a cold start, we could actually rupture that rupture that steel core. Yep. And why is that important? Well, I don't know about you, Nick, but I've cut open hundreds of filters. Oh, yes. And every time I cut them open, when they're like this, they'll be bunched up, a bunch of filter pleats will be bunched together, and then I'll have another one that's real wide. So we're not utilizing the whole filter on one of these, and these big wide ones become plugged up. We're not using three or four fins. And then the next thing you know, the filter goes into bypass on these filters. There's a uh, spring inside here, goes into bypass, and then, uh, then what are we getting, dirty oil? We're not filtering anything then, Jeff. And uh, where's the bypass on, on this filter? Uh, there is not a bypass on that filter. The bypass is external. Oh, there's no bypass on our filters. That's right. Our bypasses, you know, every machine is designed with bypasses, but ours is built external to the filter and typically hooked up to a light so that I know if something's going wrong and it's going in a bypass, I can shut that machine down. Question. Yeah. The 316, they pointed out that they they don't have a spin on inch on a filter. They have a cartridge. Cartridge? With a, they said that's the new green. Would they be going to that on all this stuff? Yeah. The question is, is, is uh, on one of our one of our excavators over there, that they went with a cartridge type filter instead of a spin-on engine oil filter for green and for sustainability. And that's absolutely correct. If you think about the amount of material within this filter that we're just gonna throw away, we've got an aluminum end cap on, on the cap filters, this O-ring and this steel housing along with all the plastic and the uh, filter media inside. Now, the filter media inside is still the part that we're gonna, we're gonna throw away. But the big difference is, is these are all dissimilar materials, much, much harder to recycle than if we would have just one piece or an all steel filter canister. But even if you had an all steel filter canister, one of the EPA regulations today is in the US is that all these have to be compacted 
and completely drained before they can go into a landfill. Uh, so for example, if they find whole filter canisters in a landfill, they'll shut that landfill down for so, EPA. Yep. All right, so Tom? Uh, thanks for your questions, guys. Great questions, fantastic, uh, great information. Thanks to all of you for attending Shop Talk with the cat maintenance experts. Now, Nick and Jeff are here every day at 1045 and 245. So if you've got other questions or you know someone who does, we invite you to come on back. Thank you. Oh, by the way, we do have one special announcement. Tomorrow, we're going to have a special guest, uh, the creator and host of Discovery Channel's Dirty Jobs. Mike Rowe's going to be here. I guess he's an old pal of yours, right? Yeah, you could say that. OK, well, he's going to be here. So come on back and uh, find out what he has to do with uh, Nick and Jeff, right? All right, thanks, All right. Tom. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Tom.